Uh, my name is Joe Burton, and I'm a lawyer. You're supposed to go. You're supposed to go. Good afternoon. Haven't you seen Alcohol Anonymous? Haven't you guys seen Alcoholics Anonymous? That's how you started out. I, it's all right. Um, we're we're here to uh, to talk about the talk about the Elconsoft case, and um, all right. Thanks, guys. Uh, we're here today to talk about the uh, the Elcomsoft case, and uh, I know it's hot, so we'll try to uh, to try to keep it a little lively. And actually, if the microphone works, I'll uh, actually go out amongst the uh, the audience, which I like to do. Trial lawyers like to be close to their uh, to their jury, and I don't like standing behind a podium, but I'm going to uh, I'm going to do that. Um, uh, what we're going to do is uh, with me um, is uh, Bill Riley. And uh, Bill is also a lawyer, but he's, he's a young enough and new enough lawyer that he's not recovering like I am. Um, so you don't, have to, uh, you don't have to say that to him. Um, and uh, let me just kind of outline for you uh, what, we're going to, uh, what we're going to talk to you about uh, this afternoon. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about the case itself a little bit. I'm going to talk about the case and sort of tell you um, where it is, kind of what we're expecting, talk a little bit about how it got to be uh, where it is, and I want to talk a little bit about some of the issues in the case, and I'm not going to bore you with, uh, uh, with a lot of detailed law, but I want to talk a little bit about some of what I think are uh, the political issues, the political slash legal issues in the case. Um, I can't talk a lot about the specific facts of the case because the case is still pending, um, and uh, we're going to be doing some things with it uh, this month. But um, I think I can talk about things that will be inter uh, interesting to you. Uh, and I'll do that first. And then after I finish, Bill's going to talk to you um, a little bit about the Digital Millennium Copyright Act itself and um, sort of uh, describe some of the features um, of that act and sort of be able to give you a little bit ba better background as to how uh, the Elkhamsoft case, uh, uh, the Elkhamsoft company and Dmitry Sklarov uh, found themselves uh, in trouble. And then Bill, what Bill will also do is kind of take some lessons that maybe we have learned from that case. They're kind of painful lessons, I'd say that. But take some of the lessons that we've learned from that case and see how we can apply them to you guys and things that may be coming up on the horizon. And then uh, we'll kind of close it out. Uh, we'll talk just a little bit briefly about some of the legislation that's been in Congress and that has been coming out uh, lately and sort of what that, what that may mean to you and sort of see how it relates to uh, the DMCA, which was kind of a watershed uh, uh, in that regard. So that's kind of what the, uh, that's what the program's going to be. And, um, I know it's hot, and uh, we'll keep moving. If somebody, if you want to go out and uh, and uh, go into the into the cooler air outside, if you can believe that, um, yeah, that's okay. I want you to do me a favor. If I wave my hand like this, somebody be kind enough to bring me a little cup of water um, in case I drink all the water up here, because um, it's going to it's going to get pretty hot. All right, you know. The last time I was in uh, Las Vegas was about a year ago, and I was here to visit uh, Dmitry Sklarov, um, who was at that point in time in the county jail. He was in federal custody, and he was in the county jail here. And uh, we had been retained on the case to represent uh, Dmitry, and uh, I came out to see him. So it's almost, it's almost a year since those events uh, originally uh, originally unfolded. Um, and in fact, um, uh, August 6th, thanks a lot, thanks a lot for that, um, is, uh, is a, uh, a closer date, and I'll tell you about uh, August 6th in a second. But it's about a year ago since this whole thing started. And how many people know about the case? I mean, I, the, the most people know about it and have heard of it. I mean, and it started when Dimitri was here 
at DEF CON last year in Dmitry and the Elcomsoft company. Elcomsoft is a Russian software company based in Moscow. And uh, they were here at DEF CON demonstrating some of their products, and particularly uh, Dmitry gave a talk about uh, uh, decryption, and particularly decryption of PDF files. Well, as a result of that, and it's really not as a result totally of that, because there were events that were going on before they ever got here, but I guess the best way to put it is that the government took that as an opportunity to arrest Dimitri and charge him. And the interesting thing about this is they um, arrested an individual. Um, and they initially didn't charge the company. They ended up arresting, uh, arresting Dimitri in his hotel room, not while the speech was going on. That would have caused a whole lot of fur. Uh, hopefully I won't get arrested today. I don't expect that I am while I'm giving this. Um, but they didn't arrest him during the speech, but they waited, um, uh, and uh, he was in his hotel room, in fact, getting ready to, uh, uh, to leave before he was arrested. Uh, uh, we got involved in the uh, uh, got involved in the case um, uh, because one of the things that I do is uh, criminal defense. In fact, that's a lot of what I do. I do white collar criminal defense, um, and I like to think what I do is uh, now is I'm sort of a prophylactic, and that is I try to keep people out of trouble before the act, and uh, and actually then if they get in trouble after the act, I'm sort of an after the after the fact pill, but. Um, um, what I do a lot now is to be the prophylactic and try to give advice so that people don't get themselves in trouble. But one thing that I feel that I want to do and I always have done as a defense counsel is you want to represent, I like to represent the underdog. And the underdog uh, in cases, frankly, when you're going against the government can be yeah. a lot of things. Large corporations can be the underdog. The Anderson uh, Corporation can be an underdog. We can argue about the politics of that, but they can be an underdog. But particularly when you're talking about individuals, um, that's the underdog. And that's a reason that I wanted to get involved in that case, apart from the fact that um, network security is something I've been interested in, and it's an area of the law that, that we're trying to develop. Um, now, why is that case uh, important? Why is the case important? And, and thinking about what to say to you today, I was thinking that the, uh, the most important thing, if you will, that I can give to you is to try to explain why the case is important. And there may be different, people may have different reasons. But this is, I, I believe, uh, the reason. And the reason is we need to have now, given the existence of the, of the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, there needs to be a standard for legitimate activity, legitimate conduct. People need to know when they're performing legitimate activity, when that's what you're trying to do and that's what, in fact, you're doing, you need to know that you're not going to get yourself in trouble, that you're not crossing the line. Now, there may be people who want to cross the line anyway. They don't care. Fingers up in the air as far as the government or whatever is concerned. That's fine. Those people can do that. I'm the, uh, I'm the morning after pill for people like that. But for people who don't want to be in that position, and that's a whole lot of people, the, what needs to happen is there needs to be some sort of standard for legitimacy. And right now, given the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, we don't know what that standard is. There really isn't. You, as a software developer, you, as a software company, and in some instances, you as users, are in situations where if you do certain things, you may find yourself in trouble, you may find yourself being arrested, and you don't know it and you had no, you had no reason to know it. That's why this case is important. Now, that standard needs to be developed by somebody other than self self-interested individuals. And by that, I mean primarily self-interested content owners. Because that's what we have right now. And let me, let me explain. I'm not against copyright, all right? I'm against some things that are being done with copyright right now. But I'm not against it. I'm not against property rights. And I'm not against content owners. But what has happened is that self copyright owners, or content owners right now, are the ones setting the agenda, setting the standard. And the problem with that is that the standard that they've set so far has no limits. It's 
difficult, if not impossible, for you to tell whether products that you may buy or products that you may develop in the area of software, particularly as it relates to um, copyright protection, whether or not it's legal or it's not legal. And why the Elcomsoft case is important is because it gives us an opportunity to try to set that standard and bring some clarity um, to it. Now, Bill's going to talk about the DMCA in a little detail, but let, let, let me say this. I'm going to say something that maybe in, the, in this group and, uh, is, sounds uh, sacrilegious. But the DMCA is not all that bad. Now, uh, I, I know, I know. The DMCA is not all that bad. The problem is the way that the DMCA is being interpreted and the way it's being applied. If you go and look at the legislative history of the DMCA, I would tell you that I bet that the, a majority of people would agree with what was trying to be done there. And what was trying to be done there seems to me, you may disagree and we can talk about it, we'll have time for questions on that, but it seems to me to make sense. And the idea there was to try to prevent cir the circumstance where copyrighted content, property of someone else, was going to be unlawfully appropriated or infringed, copyright, in, uh, copyright infringement. It was designed to figure out another way to prevent that in the digital age. Well, I don't know that I think that that's such a terrible thing in and of itself. So the act, as Congress, I think, intended it to be, is not so bad. But what's happened is that self-interest have hijacked it and have turned it into something where it is bad, where it really makes a mockery of consumer interest, of, uh, of, of, your, uh, of your interest. Uh, that is the problem. And the only way to solve that problem, there are really going to be two ways to solve that problem. One is to repeal the act and come up with a new act. And that, in the climate that we're in now, is not likely to happen. That's probably not going to happen. Maybe, but I don't think so. Um, and the only other way is to try to erode it away by, through the courts and through the law, through interpretation. Now, sometimes that takes a long time um, to do. And sometimes you get lucky. And if you have the right case and the right circumstances, you can go get moving in the right direction um, without taking um, a long time. The problem with the current interpretation is that it's overly broad. And I'll give you an example. How many people heard about, I think it's the Snowsoft case? This is the, okay. Now, HP, HP, uh, these people wrote an exploit for, I believe it is for a Unix system. It's well known. They wrote an exploit for it. HP said, you know what? Well, let me put it this way. One of the vice presidents of HP said, you know what? We don't like that. We don't like the fact that you've put that out there. And they wrote a letter to the guys at Snowsoft, and they said, you know what? If you don't get rid of it, if you don't stop doing that, you guys are going to go to jail. And I mean that. You could be subject to $500,000 fine. You could go to jail. That's what they wrote in the letter to them. Now imagine if that's you and you get that letter and you've got your fledgling software company or your non-fledgling software company. What are you going to do? You're going to be chilled by that. And maybe not only chilled, but, but your business may even, be, uh, may even be killed. The reason that happened is the first lawyer at HP or whoever did it um, took the prevailing view, which is an overly broad interpretation of the rights of content owners and of what the Digital Millennium Copyright Act says. Now, to a certain degree, to HP's credit, somebody with some common sense and some uh, law sense, I hope, thought better of it, and the following day they basically rescinded it and said, hey, we're not going to do that. We, we didn't mean, that's not our policy, we didn't mean to write that letter, we don't mean what we said there, we don't mean to use the Digital Millennium Copyright Act in that sort of fashion. Well, that's good. But the problem is, it's out there, and the reaction now from people is to reach for the gun and to shoot and ask questions later. And sometimes when you shoot and ask questions later, people get hurt. 
um, and sometimes when you shoot and ask questions later, uh, businesses uh, get killed. Now, what we hope to do with the Elcomsoft case is to trim back this overly broad interpretation into one that is much more in line, if not in fact in line, with what Congress meant, and in line with, with those things that will, will give you rights that you've had before, security and not having to worry about activity, legitimate activity, uh, security and not having to worry about that you'll be uh, that you'll be arrested and thrown uh, and thrown into jail. And for U.S. consumers, as I said, give you rights to do some things um, that you always could do, and in my view, you always ought to be able to do, even though we're in the digital age. So that's hopefully what we're going to try to accomplish with the case. Um, you know, we're sort of in the age of what I call the uh, the age of overreaction, and the. Uh, the uh, Snowsoft case is an example of that. Um, but I want to sort of talk about that uh, in this way. Um, as I said, one of the things that, um, that I do is network security law. And what that means is one aspect of what I do when I'm not defending um, individuals or corporations in uh, criminal cases is um, uh, I, uh, I give advice and uh, training to companies and individuals um, uh, in, the, in the security uh, business and uh, individuals online about legal issues related to network security law. And there are really two arms to network security law. One of those arms has to do with what I call um, content security. And that's where the Elcomsoft case falls. And that has to do with all of these issues about um, access to and getting into content and copying DVDs, copying music, et cetera, et cetera. That's the content arm. On the other side of uh, information security is the network security arm. And that has to do with issues like network intrusions, uh, et cetera. It's it's funny to me, and that's not funny ha-ha, but that's funny curious to me, that right now where we see the most legal activity, um, um, and we see really vigorous legal activity, is on the content side. Companies like Elcomsoft, companies who make products that allegedly uh, are used to circumvent uh, music protection or ebook protection, et cetera, uh, the recording industry, the music industry, tremendous amount of lawsuits and legal activity on that side uh, for uh, alleged violations. On the other hand, um, where there uh, are, in my mind, violations involving um, network security issues, for example, where you maybe make lousy software, and your lousy software is the result of some sort of uh, security breach, and that security breach causes harm to others, you're not seeing very much legal activity on, uh, on, on that side of the, uh, of the equation. And you can, you can ask yourself the question, why is that? Um, why is the activity the other way? Now, I will. T the good news, in one sense, is, is that's going to change, and over time, you're going to see that sort of you're going to see that sort of legal activity. And one of the reasons it's going to change is because of, uh, of infrastructure security concerns. The government is going to require um, is going to start imposing uh, requirements and uh, is going to be essentially moving toward liability. So you're going to see that. But that doesn't, that doesn't help now, and it doesn't make people on the content side feel any, uh, feel any better when they, ask the, when they ask the question, why me? When I'm doing something uh, uh, that I intended to be legitimate and that was good, why am I in trouble? One of the reasons that I think that this case, the Alcomsoft case, is um, really a prototypical case, and, and it's the case to hopefully uh, be the breakthrough is it involves a legitimate business. And it involves a business that was trying to do uh, uh, a legitimate end, legitimate goals. That really is important. In this area, very often we've had some, I think, unsympathetic um, uh, defendants. And that's made it difficult, even though their cause or position may have been correct. It makes it sometimes difficult in that context to make the sort of movement in the law that you want. And um, um, it's my feeling that the Elcomsoft case is a little different that way. 
and um, that may give us an opportunity uh, to move forward because Elcom Soft as a company is just like almost all of, every one of you out there. Um, they're out there, they're trying to do the right thing, um, and uh, that should hopefully make a difference. Let me talk about the case real, real briefly. How am I doing on, on time? All right? All right. Uh, July 16 of last year, that's when uh, Dimitri was, uh, was arrested here. And it really uh, wasn't until August 6th, he was in custody until August 6th. And we managed to get him out on bail um, August 6th. And um, he had a really torturous journey. It took 10 days to, call, to go here in Las Vegas to uh, San Jose where the trial court was. Um, in sort of a torturous around the country uh, trip uh, by the Marshal Service uh, to get there. And so imagine if you were in a strange country, I'll you know, take Afghanistan or take any country you want, um, and uh, you're there and you sort of put away for 10 days with very little access um, to uh, people that love you, that care about you. Um, I mean, imagine how hard that was. And uh, Dimitri, to his credit, um, stood up very well to that. Uh, to that. You know, he's a very uh, intelligent um, guy. Um, very personal, very intelligent uh, guy. And uh, he did well through the ordeal, but it wasn't until August 6th uh, that we were able to get him, out, get him out of custody. And getting him out of custody meant that he only had a larger jail, which means he had to stay in the United States. He wasn't able to go back home. And his family, he had at that time a very small child who had, uh, who at that time I think was uh, was a little over six months old who had been born. He had an older, he had an older child and his wife. Um, so imagine being torn away from your kid um, uh, at that point. Um, we did manage to get him out of jail. August, uh, August the 28th, uh, he was indicted. And the interesting thing about the indictment was at that point in time, they not only indicted Dimitri, but they indicted the company. Originally, the charges were not against the company, um, though it's my view they always intended um, to go after the company. But um, it wasn't until the uh, it wasn't until the uh, uh, it wasn't until the indictment that uh, the uh, the company was charged. Um, or September, September, and I believe it was September the thirteenth. September the 13th, we were able to bring Dimitri's wife and his family over to the United States, which made a really big difference to him in terms of trying to, uh, to stay up and be ready for, uh, for what we thought at that point in time was going to be, uh, was going to be a, long, a long ordeal. Um, later in September, we hired, uh, we brought in another lawyer, John Kecker who's uh, one of the finest trial lawyers in the United States, a friend of mine, somebody who I've long, known a long time. And we brought in John to represent Dimitri, and I continued to represent uh, the company at that point in time. It wasn't until December, and I think it was December 13th, that we were able to work out a, a, a deal with the government where Dimitri was allowed to go home and the company would stand, it would stand up. And I don't know if people remember this, but almost from the beginning, one of the great things that Elcomsoft did and, and that Alex Gadoloff did was to say, look, take me. If you want to do this thing, if you want to charge somebody with a criminal offense, if what's happened here is a violation of the law at all, but if you think it's criminal, take me. Don't take this guy who's got this family, who's an employee of the company, who's an engineer, who all he did was to develop a program, take me. Um, that didn't happen. And it really wasn't until about uh, December the 13th that we were able to do that. And what happened was, uh, Dimitri entered into a deferred prosecution agreement. So finally, for the last time, let me make clear what that means. Deferred prosecution agreement says you've been charged with an offense. If you do certain things according to this agreement, we will dismiss the charges against you. It's as if they never occurred. We'll dismiss the charges. Okay. Now, what are the things that had to happen? 
Dmitry had to obey laws, had to make himself available for trial if there was a trial against the company, and he had to tell the truth. He didn't have to snitch on his company. He's not testifying against his company. All he has to do is tell the truth as far as he knows it. That's what he had to do. And that's a great deal. That just makes him a witness and allows him to go home, which is something that should have happened for a long time. And it took us about five months uh, in order to get it done. But we finally did get it done, and he went home, and he was home for Christmas. Um, so uh, that was a good thing. Um, after the, uh, the beginning of the year, in the case, we filed motions, uh, meaning legal arguments with respect to the case. And uh, let me just talk about a little bit about a couple of those motions. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, but a couple of them are important um, uh, as to some of the issues that I raised before. One of the motions that we raised in that case had to do with extraterritorial application of the law, and that is um, we made the argument where the activity is in cyberspace, um, if the activity occurs in cyberspace, how is it that the United States government gets to charge an individual for activity that occurs in cyberspace? Well, the government takes sort of a contrary view, and the government t took the view that, well, yeah, cyberspace, cyberspace, cyberspace doesn't really mean anything. All that is is that is a bunch of computers down on the ground someplace, and as long as we have a computer somewhere in the United States that's involved in the transaction, that's sufficient to give us jurisdiction. So we lost that motion because the judge agreed to that. Well, I got to tell you that, um, you know, I think that motion's ahead of its time. Um, maybe we'll get an opportunity to, uh, to take that on appeal, um, if there is an appeal in this case. Um, but I have to tell you that uh, you could mark my words, but 10 years from now, um, the question of territoriality as it applies to cyberspace is going to be a lot more well understood and accepted. And um, um, in another case like that, it's not going to be the same result. Probably the most important motion that we raised um, was a motion having to do with a due process and having to do with um, the vagueness of the statute. And most specifically, having to do with this notion of what happens if I make a tool and that tool can be used for good or that tool can be, uh, that tool can be used for bad. Um, am I liable? If I don't intend to use that tool for a bad reason or for a bad purpose, am I liable? And would I know that ahead of time uh, when, I create, uh, when I create the tool? Um, that's another motion that we lost. And um, I think that that's a, a, a very significant um, issue. And I think that there's some significant chance that we're going to be vindicated about that um, if, there's a, uh, if there's an appeal uh, in the case. Now, you might say, well, you file those two motions and you lost both of, both of the motions. You guys ought to pack up and go home. Well, we're not going to pack up and go home. There's going to be a trial. And the trial is going to uh, start on August the 26th. And I think that's probably very likely um, that it's going to, uh, that it will start on August the 26th. There's always some possibility that there might be uh, some small delay, but um, uh, knowing what I know, um, I think it's going to go forward uh, on August 26th. And uh, what I'd say to you is, um, I wouldn't, uh, I, I wouldn't be um, dissuaded. Uh, are overly concerned because, at least to this point, um, things haven't gone the way we precisely the way we'd like them. I think that we have some things to say uh, to a jury, um, and um, you, you can I can feel reasonably confident about that. Um, I guess I'm reminded of uh, two things. There was a guy named uh, uh, Joe Namath who, uh, many many years ago, was in Super Bowl three. And uh, at that time, the, uh, the fledgling New York Jets were part of the, uh, the American Football League. And they were playing the, uh, the Baltimore Colts, uh, who were powers in the, uh, in the National Football League, in the National Football Conference. This was like the third Super Bowl at the time. And the, uh, uh, the Colts were overwhelming favorites. And uh, they asked... Joe Namath, what he thought about that, and he said, well, what do I think about it? Well, I think, uh, I guarantee that we're, we're going to win. Well, they did. 
Now, I'm not Joe Namath um, in that case, uh, but I think the same. I think the same thing. I think it because I have to think it, and I think it because I because I believe it. Um, there are lots of instances where the cases don't look uh, so good, where uh, the outcome uh, is surprising, and I think that this might well be uh, one of one of those cases. So that's a little bit about the case. I'll, I'll have a chance to uh, answer any questions you have about about the case itself, uh, to the extent that I can, and um, some of the other issues that I raised in the beginning at the end of this. And I'll let uh, Bill talk a little bit about the DMCA. Club? Yeah, uh, Joe mentioned something about the interpretation. And the way the interpretation has been going uh, all across the country, at the appellate level, the trial level, and there's an incredible amount of uh, confusion regarding the DMCA and the way that uh, the, the, the different jurisdictions have interpreted it. And if you read any of the... Uh, uh, any of the columns in a slash dot and all of the, con the commentary, you can, you can see that there's an amazing amount of disinformation being spun around as well. I know we don't have much time, but at least I just wanted to be able to explain that the DMCA can be, if you just read it on its surface, it can be actually very complicated, but there's a kind of a simplistic way to be able to, uh, to explain it. So then, at least when you guys go home, you're going to have a little bit better understanding of the framework in which a lot of these discussions are coming in, and also the way that it might actually impact you guys if you're going to be uh, doing coding or if you're going to be, especially actually uh, uh, if you're a non-U.S. coder. And there's actually some very specific uh, recommendations to be able to how to stay outside of U.S. jurisdiction. And so I think the, probably the best way to skip through this is there's a couple of provisions in the DMCA, and everybody's familiar probably with uh, the, US, the, the ISP safe harbor provisions, and that's what Napster tried to uh, assert unsuccessfully, and that's what Kazaa is trying to assert right now. And that's a completely different area of the DMCA, even though it's still under the same umbrella of the DMCA. What we're talking about here is the anti-circumvention provisions of the DMCA. And those basically, uh, they prescribe two different types of uh, software code. And it's, it's, it's confusing if you just read that the way that the code is written. But basically what it is, is if you think about it in a simplistic way, if you have a, let's say if this is just a raw naked code, it can be a movie, an e-book, let's, let's just stay with the e-book for example. It's, it's, it's just raw and it's naked, it's completely unprotected. And so what the, uh, the content owners wanted to be able to have is the first part of code, is they wanted to be able to say, we're gonna be able to place this in, a, uh, in some sort of lock form. See, uh, and the code that's going to be relevant to this is, is basically just a lock. It's going to be, and this is what's called an access control. And this is, a, this is like a, the serial numbers, uh, things like that, uh, any type of PIN number, any type of uh, technical constraint that uh, prevents you from gaining access to the, uh, the underlying code. And so what they did is they said, okay, there's two things that they've done with access code. They said the first thing is that the act the actual act of breaking the, uh, the code that's wrapped around the, uh, uh, the actual, we'll call this just the naked code, that act is prescribed under the DMCA. The other part is the, tra it's called the trafficking provision or the anti-trafficking provision. And it's when you actually, it's the, uh, you know, I've got some, uh, here, it might help if I do, uh, a bit here it's stuck. I think it's asleep here. The heat. Okay, probably it's best to look at it like this. 1201A prevents the, uh, this is the act of uh, uh, circumventing the access controls. But the other thing it does is there's something called the tools. And it's the tools that, uh, this is, the, this is the, the second of the three provisions of it. It says it prohibits the manufacture, the import, the offer to the public, provide otherwise, and the access controls. So it's basically doing any of those things that's creating the code that's going to be able to enable somebody to do the underlying act, which is accessing the code without the rights. But there hasn't been a lot of litigation, a lot of stress on this. The big controversial area, and you can see here that that's, that's prescribed, the big controversial area here so far with most of the litigation, and that's, uh, never mind. Well, I don't think I need that, is 
that what people do is there's something called the uh, copy controls. And what the copy controls are is like, if you, if you recall, just like the basic uh, copyright law, and there's something that's called a, a basket of uh, exclusive copyrights. That's like to be able, if, if once you become a content owner, you're able to, uh, you're, uh, it's a limited amount of people that uh, or the access to the control of the code. You can uh, limit the uh, you know, distribution rights and things like that. And so what the content owners were afraid of is that uh, once naked code gets outside of a box, then people will be able to ship it around the internet and infringe on the copyrights. And so what they did is the second part is they prescribed something when you have wrapped code around. Uh, you can see we spent a lot of money on the props here. It's a, uh, you just wrap the code. So basically this is, uh, this is a copy control uh, code. And then what they've done is they prescribed, and this is what Dimitri ran into the problem with in Alcomsoft and several other people, is they've written the code that's actually used to defeat the copy controls. So there's two codes here. I don't know if that's uh, clear enough, but you have uh, the, the copy control code and this code here. And we're not going to get into the actual arguments that we develop, but I think it might be helpful for people to take a look at how the federal government has prosecuted these cases. And you can learn some of the, uh, the lessons that the, way that the U.S. attorneys and the FBI have done it. So the first thing, what I wanted to be able to do is just to sort of explain that the location in the server uh, or the web hosting service is incredibly critical because what they're trying to do, for example, if you're outside the United States, obviously you're outside the U.S. jurisdiction of the United States, but the way that the uh, U.S. Attorney's Office has been able to imply or infer jurisdiction is being, being taken a look sort of in whole of all of the types of activities that are used to be able to sort of traffic in this code. So the location is extremely important. And if you're, if you're a German or if you're a Russian company, you've got to be very careful because, like, for example, if you host your code on an ISP in Atlanta, one, there's a contractual uh, jurisdiction issue right there because you've entered into a contractual relations with a company in Atlanta. But also, it's actually the, the bits of the code are actually physically residing. And so the courts have found it quite persuasive. And so they can actually say, okay, we have a right to be able to uh, to at least uh, indict somebody for something like this in the, in the criminal area. Another part is the website. And the, uh, the U.S. Attorney's Office and the FBI, they're going to take a look to see the tone of the website. And if you're, if they, uh, they're looking for intent that you might have been using this uh, software, for example, like this, uh, the copy control uh, access software, that you might be using that for to uh, promote infringement. And it, it was, it's highly advisable to be able to figure that when, and this is this is actually applies to anybody at any time that's putting anything up on a website, as the guys from 2600 found out, is when you're writing stuff on your website, imagine, just run it through the jury test. It's like, you can imagine if a prosecutor or the plaintiff's attorney is reading your code, or reading your, uh, uh, the content that you have on the website to a jury, and run it through that, because it's very persuasive to juries and to uh, judges, when, especially at the pretrial area, when they're trying to discover if there's jurisdiction or not. Then there's uh, telephone and contact information. If you have 1-800 numbers, for example, then it's, they're going to say, well, you know, if you have a 1-800 number, it's only accessible in Canada or the United States or the Caribbean. So it's like, well, you must have been intending to do business in the United States. Meta tags, that's another thing. This applies across the whole spectrum as well, as the guys from 2600 found out as well. That they'll take a look at the meta tags and they'll string them together. The words like infringement, the words like crack, or the words like hack, things like that. Uh, that can be also very persuasive. Declarations and warnings, and this is something that you see almost in every, uh, uh, well, alternative website, we'll call it that, is this was actually in the U.S. Attorney's Manual. You've, you've, you've probably read it a hundred times. Anytime that someone says, okay, I've made this, I've developed this software, and it does the, this really uh, nasty stuff, and it can do this nasty stuff and this nasty stuff. So if you're going to do that nasty stuff, don't download it. And a lot of people think, well, that's good enough to be able to sort of separate me. I'm, you know, I've told them not to do it. But actually, the U.S. Attorney's Office has said, use that against the people because they can use that as saying that this is the information that you knew at the time when you were releasing it and trafficking, uh, or at least making it available to the, uh, to the public. So that will end up being used against you because you're basically saying, yes, I know it does all this nasty stuff. So they've, they've put that link there before they might have had to infer it. The location of the software, that's also something that a lot of people don't think about, but if you're a German company, you're selling just to Danish companies, and you have an ISP that's located in France, but say, for example, that they're 
uh, that might be cast in the United States or say that uh, they might have some sort of uh, uh, a backup data center in the United States, and if it's residing here, I'm not saying that that's actually uh, that that could actually tip the balance, but it's certainly persuasive. Uh, credit card uh, transaction processor obviously is incredibly important as well, and correspondence. If you're, you know, you have to watch out for all the correspondence you're doing, even on Usenet files, any type of uh, uh, correspondence. They're going to scan. They're going to do a complete. Uh, like the, you know, the Wayback Machine, they're going to go back and they're going to try and reconstruct what your website's done so in case you found out. Uh, and just, just a reminder again, what they're trying to do is they're trying to look to see if they can get something you to basically what you can fail the smell test. Something they can, you know, the prosecutor can go up in front of the judge and say, these guys are really bad and this is the intent. Because a lot of, face it, a lot of what we're talking about here are, is t are tools that have multiple purposes. And so they can be used for good and used for bad. So these are the things that people just do on their websites. So they don't realize that they're actually giving the prosecution ammunition. And Joe spoke about uh, uh, Snowsoft. And uh, Joe, did you want to just mention, I think uh, Jennifer Granick yesterday pretty much covered the, uh, the Patriot Act pretty well. But there's, and also we don't have a lot of time, but I know there's a, this, there's a new House bill, 3482, that you guys might have heard about, that it's made a lot of headlines with regards to uh, life sentences for hacking uh, and for uh, cyber crimes. And that actually, I, I think Joe probably has some comments on that, or? Hear me? Yeah. That's bad. Yeah, um, it's sort of an interesting uh, circumstance. If that didn't wake you up, it ought to. Um, when you're talking about potentially having life sentences for uh, for hacking, now uh, it ought to wake you up. Um, one could make the argument. You have what you have to do is you have to see what that what that bill says, and it's life sentences for intentional or reckless activity that may uh, that uh, that leads to uh, a loss uh, a loss of life so really what's happened in one sense is you since the federal government really doesn't have a homicide statute um, um, uh, the federal government does it in sort of bits and pieces and what you have in in uh, in one part is to to make um, one form of homicide sort of involuntary uh, uh, involuntary uh, manslaughter or second degree uh, murder um, uh, uh, by a computer in this case um, they've made that potentially an offense for which you could uh, for which you should you could get life and a lot of that is a reaction to um, infrastructure issues so for example let's say you had some some cyber terrorist um, who decided to take over the air traffic control system and he decides to shut it down or whatever or divert it and that causes an airplane an airplane to crash into uh, into the ground or to crash anywhere and people die well um, um, and he does that by use of some uh, some uh, computer intrusion it would have to be by that um, that's a circumstance in which uh, which uh, uh, the bill contemplates you might uh, justify a life sentence, or the same thing. Suppose somebody takes over the Hoover Dam and uh, and, turn, and you know unleashes the Hoover Dam, and you've got a loss of life and a loss of property. That's a circumstance in which um, uh, you could contemplate uh, a life sentence. The problem with that, uh, the problem with anything like that, or what you have to be aware of, is it doesn't necessarily have to be limited to only those circumstances. And the definition of reckless, reckless is a form of negligence. It's an extreme form of negligence, um, but that's what it is. And when I say that, it can be gray, uh, like a lot of things in the law. And when you have that, you have the potential for um, perhaps activity that, um, uh, that you wouldn't expect or that doesn't fall into the two areas that I said. Um, to lead to somebody being indicted and potentially charged with uh, uh, going to jail for life. That's pretty sobering, I think. Okay, and um, with regards to the European cyber crime trade, I don't want to really add too much to that, but I just want to say that the Europeans have even made it a little bit worse because remember what I was talking about with the DMCA, the, the 
what they've done is they've banned the trafficking of the tools or they've banned actually the act of doing the uh, access control. But what they haven't done is they haven't banned the possession of these tools yet. And the European Cybercrime Treaty has actually banned the possession of these tools, which is actually, it's, it's, that's really actually amazing. The good thing about it is they've made some significant carve-outs. Well, it's actually interesting to see how it's actually going to be interpreted, but they made some significant carve-outs for network security research. So that was sort of like the compromise. But, and as far as the, there's just, I guess we want to leave some time for questions. Of course, yeah. One other bill I want to mention is, and people probably have heard of it, and that's the Hollings Bill, um, which uh, purports to uh, require uh, hardware manufacturers to have in the hardware some sort of copy protection device. And that's going to be a requirement. Well, now, th think about that. So now if it's in hardware, and if, uh, as a matter of software, um, you've got software protection. Well, you have a circumstance where the DMCA is going to protect uh, against okay, against certain sorts of, t almost all kinds of tools that are designed to get around those kinds of protections. It really gets dicey to understand um, what kind of tool you can make that wouldn't fall within one of those two laws. And the end result of that is if people don't make the tools, then the consumer, people at the end, use, um, may not have the same rights that they had before. That's what's really scary. And that bill is really an extension of the DMCA, and it's a pretty uh, dangerous one. It closes a hole, um, and it makes it uh, much, much more difficult for us to have the kind of digital rights that we should have. Is there any questions? Any regards? Uh, what about the, the placement of the web server? The question was, what about the uh, the placement of the web server? Would the case have uh, would the case have come down even had um, Elcomsoft hosted? The, uh, it's a web server in Russia. Answer is you'd think not. However, the government's position, the, the government position and the law right now is really if there are sufficient contacts, it's not just the server, but if there are sufficient contacts um, in the United States involving the illegal activity, for example, one of the things that Elcomsoft did is used a, uh, a service to collect money, a pay service in the United States. Um, the government argued, hey, that's enough to give it jurisdiction. And there were some other things. So the answer is it shouldn't be, but I think right now the way it would be interpreted, the answer would be yes. The question was, if uh, is the only way to be safe, if assuming you're completely outside of the United States, is to uh, is to block access um, to your web server. I think that, that that that's a factor. I guess I would say I don't know that you necessarily have to go. Uh, yeah, I, I, the reason the reason the answer is yes is because this question is an answer. If I if I'm there and all I do, <clears throat> let's assume I don't have any I don't have any uh, 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 pay service in the United States. I don't solicit in the United States. I don't do anything. The only thing that I do is I put this up for uh, for sale in my web server. You would think that that would be safe. Not clear. And so what you'd have by blocking access from the United States is an argument about intent and that hopefully you could convince somebody. But you might have somebody who didn't buy that argument and you'd still be there. But that's probably, if, if I were your lawyer, I'd say, yes, that's, that's what you should do. Uh, I think the question was, you tell me if I'm wrong, the question was, what's the jurisdiction for <coughs> U.S. citizens who commit an act outside of the United States? Am I right? That's not against the law in the country. The, that's not against the law in the country they're in, but it's against U.S. law, right? And, and, what's, the, and what's the other part of it? 
for a foreigner who is not against the law in their country, but against the law here. All right, we, so we have the answer to the converse. That's the Elkhamsoff case. Bad answer, but that's the answer. The answer to, to the contra converse is uh, the same thing. Now, that's a little bit more difficult. Um, U.S. laws can have extraterritorial effect. Normally what you want is that you want, the, the law should indicate that it's meant to be applied extraterritorially. Right. But it's, it, it's conceivable to have lots of circumstances where laws have U.S. Uh, extraterritorial effect. This best example is what happens when an embassy is bombed, um, U.S. embassy is bombed overseas, something like that. Um, you can have jurisdiction. You, you, uh, oh, that's right. But but you can have other acts that are overseas. You could have acts that involve the planning of it, for example, the activities caused over there. So it's possible to do it. Uh, I would say the way that you'd want to do it is to have that provision explicitly in the law. That's something we argued in Alcomsoft, that it should be explicitly in the law. That, that, that argument wasn't bought at this point. And I'd just like to add one thing to that. Is, uh, yeah, he's right. It does have, it's, the Congress should... Uh, write the law so it's, it's actually explicit. And you can see that with the statutory rape laws. For example, if it's legal to have sex with a, a minor in Thailand, like it's under 16, but they've specifically written the statutory rape law so if a U.S. citizen intends to go to Thailand to have sex with an underage person, even though it's legal in Thailand, it's breaking a U.S. law. So when they come back into the United States, they can be uh, remanded into custody. So it has to be pretty. It has to be very specific that that was the congressional intent to be able to have it apply overseas. And there's a couple more examples, but yeah, it's it has to be pretty safe. You can pretty much find out what the intent is because it goes down to notice. Um, Are we done? One more. Oh, we're out here. Okay. All right. Thanks. Thank you.